My name is Kent uh, Wittenberg. Uh, I'm a member of the Adult Religious Education Committee here, and uh, we are the ones hosting the event. Uh, and at King's Chapel, poetry is a part of our community life, and uh, we are really thrilled to host uh, the event here for you today. Uh, Reggie Gibson is our guest. Uh, for those of you who know him, you know what a tweet that is. And he's an extraordinary poet, musician, literary performer. I think he maybe coined that term. I haven't heard of him before. Maybe there aren't any others. Um, librettist, actor, playwright, educator, and I'm sure there's other there's other things, but that's quite a list. He's an amazing fellow. He's performed all over the US, Europe, and Cuba. And he's won many awards, including the US National Poetry Slam Competition. Uh, the Italian Absolute Poetry Award and the Ver Europe in Verse Award in Italy. He said he has had a nomination for Boston Emmy and many grants, and while well, among which are a Live Arts Boston grant to develop his first play. Uh, is that forthcoming? Yes, it's, that, um, it's going to be also put on at the Boston New Works Festival in June. In June. So there you go. So you can see Reggie has many talents. And his work, one thing I'd say, he, he embodies Stanley Kunis's comments, which I think Reggie mentioned in an interview, that for the poem to find its fullest expression, it must have a voice. And I would say for Reggie, he, not only does he have a voice, but he's got other sounds <laughs> and uh, other sights as well. So his performance is going to last about 50 minutes. Uh, we'll have time for about 10 minutes, we hope for Q&A. David Waters is going to moderate that. So if you have any questions, you'll be able to have a chance to, to ask them. And also we are recording this, just so you will know. Um, so please join me in welcoming Reggie Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for posting me for what you put out there for the pictures. And the food and all of that stuff. Um, really do appreciate it. Thank you all for being here, um, for breathing, right? <laughs> this is one of those things where, as we take it for granted, this inhalation, exhalation thing, like it's gonna last, and we know deep in our heart of hearts they will not, right? My um my great grandfather would say something like, any day spent looking down at the blossoms beats an eternity looking up at the roots. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. and, you know, as I um, now, you know, become a man of a certain age, you know, I find myself making that long trek, you know, uh, from, the, from the bedroom to the bathroom. Um, and, and I've cursed this fate until I read something that said, 90, between 96,000 and 125,000 people die every night in their sleep. And it tends to happen between the hours of 11 o'clock p.m. and 4 o'clock a.m. Hmm. So when I have to use the bathroom at 3 a.m., I have a whole different attitude um, yeah. about it, man. I wake up, I'm like, yeah, right? <laughs> like, one more hour to go. <laughs> Just a head of the hunters. <laughs> Where I come from, um, in Chicago, it is a French section of town known as Le Hood. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have heard of Le Hood. So, little what happens if you go through a certain section of Le Hood is you will go past a series of churches. And if you go past a series of churches, what you will hear is some of the most beautiful gospel music you've ever heard pouring out of that church. But every now and then, you get to a space and you will hear one voice coming out of that church that arrests you. It grabs you, it will not let you go. It is um, a voice that dissolves the covalent bonds of your molecules. And you're like, I don't know what's happening to me, but, but I'm opening up, I'm being cracked open by this voice. Where I come from in Lake Hood, when someone has a voice like that, we don't say that person can see. Let's see if anybody knows what we say. We say that person can do what? Sign. 
Right. They do, they do what Gimli Dickinson said to do with the truth. They just say it, but say it slant, right? It's a thing where it just gets in you and, and you become a plate of syrup and it's a biscuit. And it's just <laughs> getting, getting everything out. And so we don't say, again, yeah, the person can say, the person can say. And likewise, when someone has a certain je ne sais quoi, right? A certain indefinable thing about them that abides with you, but you've got the no language for it. We don't say that person has a thing about them. What do we say to you? <laughs> Something about them. You can't quite put my finger on it. It's material, it's ephemeral, but it's there. It advise. So I set you up for this. I can teach you some bad language. I'll teach you to speak English the right way, which is the way I grew up speaking it. When I do like, when I, you know, you'll know when it happens. I just need you to give me this. You need to say this. That thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. Be thankful, thankful for that thing. Can we try that? Yeah. All right, let's try. That thing, that thing, that thing, that thing. Be thankful, thankful for that thing. Now each one of us who's felt it, we know it's the sweetest feeling felt. That gentle touch of spirit that makes all defenses melt. It evades each attempt at language, yet it speaks to everyone. And sometimes when we are silent, we can almost hear it all. It's the reason why we fall in love, it's why particles come in pairs. It's the yin and the yang of molecules, it's why T equals MC squared. It's the reason we need poetry, because some phenomena can't be named. And I don't care at all what you call it, y'all. Let's just be thankful for that thing. <laughs> that thing, that thing, that thing, that thing, that thing, be thankful, thankful for that thing. Now, I'm not here to tell nobody here nothing nobody don't already know. And that is everything is connected from the macro to the micro. Don't believe your deceiving eyes, but deep inside you see it's true that there's a universal union between the universe and who <laughs> you. Now, some find it in their religion, some in their learned books is old, some through the arts and the sciences through a micro or telescope, but it's the mother of all mysteries from being ain't to the Big Bang. I don't care what it is you want to call it. Let's just be thankful for that day. <laughs> that day, 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 that day. We're talking prime causation, quantum fluctuation, cosmic inflation, particle creation, protons, neutrons colliding and deuterium, then into hydrogen, and then into helium, and then comes this light out of the plasma darkness. Then comes the time the stars begin their sparking, and those stars explode, and then another generation of stars begin creating nucleosynthesis, and those stars explode, and then another generation of stars begin its genesis, dust balls forming, planets forming, earth is then birthed, and then life begins dawning, prokaryotes, the animal bacteria to eukaryote, then multicellular life begins to settle in, fish to amphibian, reptilian, mammalian, primate, great ape, then homo sapiens. The last human hominid standard on a planet that demands that we somehow had to advance past the creation of strictly making hand axes and pull ourselves up out the muck and the mire, reaching the species just a little bit higher. The civilization always began around fire. Where we learned to be human, where we saw one another flickering there in the campfire. And recognize our face in each other and maybe each other in the eternal. So what do we do? We gather, we tell people stories, we make poems, we make songs. All of us trying to find that thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. And at some point, someone would stand up. And some of you know this piece, and I'm glad you do. Some woman perhaps would stand up and ask members of her tribe to talk to her. And she would do a gesture and they would give her one word. 
The word I want you to give me back is what? The word of incredulity, the word that we put to the impulse, what the human impulse to wish to know. One, two, three. What? Exactly. And that word, as I like to tell people, remind you that impulse began our trek toward human knowledge. It's the reason we have a place like this. It's the reason we have libraries. It's the reason we have schools. Trying to figure out what it means to connect to that thing. So let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology changed our minds, when a man took his hands and began to clap. And that was the beginning of a boom, boom, bam. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology changed our minds, when a woman started humming to an animal's call. And that was the beginning of a yes, yes, y'all. A yes, yes, y'all. What? Yes, yes, y'all. What? It's like that, it's like that, it's like that, y'all. What? It's like that, y'all. What? It's like that, y'all. Like y'all. And really, it is kind of. <laughs> so once again, here we are again, needing to feel what it means to be human, to feel the systole and diastole of the human heart getting rolled into poetry and music and whatever it is that comes out of this human soul. We know the body has intelligence of which the intellect cannot dismiss a consequence of biocultural experience. But let's take a quick trip and get a sense of what it means for all of us to have become human beings. Let's take a trip. Back in a time that we cannot recall, our ancestors dropped in the hollow night under the ascending stars. They believed for gods, shining down as they died by the firelight. Their bodies started moving, their voices started grunting, imitating animals. They knew they would be hunted on the next day to provide sustenance for their tribe. This was a ritual intended to recognize that life is born of death. Like sunrise and sunset, cycling from east to west, the drums were beat and feet began to step, moving from right to left, the men left. A chance to get to it. This is why what we're going to do today calls the blood. It's been this way since our species crawled from the mud, an ancient day banging in the body and the mind that we've been rooted into people since the dawn of time. So check it. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology tamed the mind, a man took his hands and began to clap. And that was the beginning of a boom, boom, bam. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology tamed the mind, a woman started on the two an animal's call. And that was the beginning of a yes, y'all. A yes, yes, y'all. What? Yes, yes, y'all. What? It's like that, y'all. It's like that, y'all. It's like that, y'all. It's like whether Irish or English or Spanish, Danish or Swedish or Polish, Russian or Turkish, Italian, German or Kurdish, Japanese or Assyrian, Japanese or Romanian, Portuguese or Hungarian, Hebrew, Zulu, Bavarian, no matter what tongue speak, languages have a beat, the body and state, the people translate into music. See what science is found. We are creatures of silence. Our ears need to speak rhythmic patterns in human speech. Black of words is better. Hit the rhythm, this hand will depend before you get out of the way. Okay, okay, you must be nothing. The verbal percussion drums inside of you, and then you'll let. Deacon's rushing, your horses get to throbbing, your head might get to bobbing, you feel the lead of death of what the rhythm has been plotting, it's gotten you to synchronize. No alpha waves and realize that rhythm is more than musical, but structurally it underlies each and every atom to plasma scattered on Saturn, every stage of matter is organized in some kind of rhythmic pattern, which is architectonic, because everything has a comic, everything has a cycle, everything has a phonic. Life depends upon it. When we are near to one, the thing that remains, refrains, come back is chronic. The thing that haunts us all. What's in the mind? We've been dancing, dancing, dancing since the dawn of time. Let's check it. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology came the mind. A man took his hands and began to clap. And that was on the end of the boom, back. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology came to mind, a woman started wanting to an animal's call. And that was on the end of the yes, y'all. A yes, yes, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. Like that, the nigga, that, the nigga, that, y'all. That, y'all. That's like that, y'all. That 
like that. Ben Mark's day in Massachusetts, when the second great poet from Chicago was shot in proposing, he never thought he'd um, buy that crazy black shirt. The one embroidered with that Eastern motif, he knew was not his style. He knew he'd only wear it once. In fact, he did only wear it once. It's that thing in his closet worn next to that other thing only worn once, now hanging up in the closet. His thought was, hey, I wonder how this will look on stage this evening. He was hey, <laughs> Likewise, when she, of Belmont, Massachusetts, wore that cleavage clinging pink halter top and ultra tight pair of black pants. You know, the outfit that screams, damn it, I'm a feminist with a master's degree in education and I demand that men respect me for my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. She was only dressing for a comfortable night out with a girlfriend, a girlfriend who ended up flaking on her at the last minute, leaving her to go out alone. She had never been out. She never been to a poetry meeting, and she almost didn't go this time. But then she did. She surprised us that day. They did not expect to meet, much less fall into one another and begin to walk that razor blade thin, spider web frail bridge, sometimes built between two people on the verge of finding one another. Interesting. <laughs> he was a man who had a rather profound liking for the lady. All of them. <laughs> but he was also profoundly shy, especially then. She, being from Massachusetts and thus a member of the Frozen Chosen, <laughs> was not really used to starting conversations with second-rate poets from Chicago she didn't know, but she was a little bit more forward than usual, especially then. And somehow, though the story is sort of apocryphal, but it's generally understood that eventually they ended up at a <laughs> And over a couple of cups of decaf coffee and they shared Gucci Tutti fresh and fruity. <laughs> he thought, maybe. And she thought, huh, maybe. See, as for you, well, you were not yet that is to say, you and you. But you are not yet this ever parasitic tsunami of rediscovery fueled by laughter and lactation, even broken CDs and glasses in your wake. <laughs> no. You are somewhere else, a small curved question, faint and forming at the end of some egg named future. Then they loved, and it was good. So they loved again. And during the August of one of those agains, the part of you that had been singing softly and alone inside of her began to sense the part of you singing softly and alone inside of him, which began to sense the part of you singing softly and alone inside of her. And those two soft, alone songs began to reach in for each other. And when they found one another, they began to grow and to swell and to sing into one song. You. Yeah. And with the growing and the swelling and the singing were done, you were lifted from inside the soft dark of her, lifted into light, into scream, into breath. After that, he took you into an empty room where no one could see the two of you, held you close to upwards at the ceiling, imagined the fluorescent lights to be some ocean of greater light stretched endlessly above a land that smelled of salt water and billows. And in the lands from which your ancestors came, he brought you close and trembling to his chest. Thanked his now dead father for your safe passage and gave thanks to whatever poet's hand authored all of this. Thank you. Friend of mine, Kent Foreman. Um, we're going back to beginnings. Um, you'll never get to meet him. Uh, he is um, whatever is the glue that holds us together has decided to bring him to another part of, and, uh, another part of existence. And he is no longer with us, but he um, was a guy who, um, who I would say we found each other when I was um, in the throes of a terrible disease. Um, 
It was called my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have probably been so affected. Yeah, some of us still have that as a <laughs> last 12 years. <laughs> um, and um, Kent, Kent was, a, was a person, he, he was very important to me. He was part of that first wave of, of Black men to be um, in, integrated into the uh, army in the 1950s, going to Korea. <clears throat> and um, he told me some, some wonderful stories about that. And um, while he was there, uh, he, he began to look at us as a species and said, what are we doing? What are we, what are we doing? So he started thinking about the first stories that he heard. One of them goes back to um, something that I think most folks would recognize. I would do it as if he was here. If he was here, he would say, I was sorely tempted to call this poem The Ways of White Folks. But because everybody does this, that's way too racist. A feminine friend of mine suggested I call this poem an ode to testosterone. <laughs> but since women do this, that's way too sexy. The philosophical agnostic in me wanted to call it a meditation upon the sanctimony of the Judeo Christian ethos. But that is decidedly too ponderous. <laughs> so I will call it what it is a testimony in defense of the first cat who ever blew his coon, the first murderer, Cain. And I quote, yeah, Abel was my brother. Yeah, I killed him. No, I am not sad. Now that book of yours said I was jealous. What I was was mad. Now remorse is in order, of course. And naturally, granddad and his divine wrath sees fit to justify me, I admit, in barring me from the primordial department store. But I didn't mind all that much. Because truthfully, y'all, Eden, or So I hit the path east to the land of Nam, where I immediately got down to the business of tilling the ground in order to cultivate a finer crop of cotton. Man, I mean, man, I am a fool. You understand? From there, I watched this spectacle of y'all, the human. You people, seriously, I mean, you outlaw my name, make it synonymous with shame, yet when I look at your history, all I see is murder. Look to your heroes and your thrillers, from Beowulf to St. James Bond. They're all killers. Now, you, you tell me, when will the slaughter cease? Since your savior was born, there hasn't been 100 years of peace. He was murdered, assassinated, excuse me, we are in the church, let's tell the truth, executed at the request of the multitudes. Why? Because the dude was so rude as to kick it to you in platitudes. <laughs> platitudes. Such a noble portrait of humanity your catechism paints, yet and still there have been far more murderers than saints. Now, I'm not to blame. It's just an element to be true. Y'all gonna have to fix an intrinsic characteristic of the human race. That human beings must eat and sleep most times with one another and find new and improved ways of annihilating each other. So yeah, Abel was my brother. And well, I am kind of proud to be the first of such a goodly, righteous, noble. In looking at that piece, um, I was looking at that piece, a friend of mine named Guy Mendelo, we we're, we're doing something called Radio Plays, and we're having, we're, 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 where we dive into particular subjects, and we, we do music, poems, stories, based upon particular themes that are timely. And the one we're doing now is called Mythology. And so we're examining the roots of, mytho of mythology, Western mythology, primarily going to, um, to Greco-Roman mythology, because we're not trying to fist fight ourselves out of it. <laughs> but we're going to Greco-Roman mythology, looking at some of how we come to see the world through, through, through that lens. And 
One of them is um, we've been looking at the myth of Pandora and reshaping and reforming that, looking at what's taught us about what women can and cannot be. Where and so we've been revisioning some of, some things that are in the background. And one of them we've come up with is a conversation that goes on between Zeus and Prometheus. Prometheus was the Titan who wanted human beings to have fire so that they could begin to, you know, to you know get the cook out on, you know, and, and do all kinds of stuff. And Zeus was like, oh no, these people don't deserve fire, right? And so we started visualizing this as a conversation after after Prometheus had given man who uh, the given man fire, what do humans talk about? So this is a conversation between them. And let's see where it goes. This is after man has gotten fire. Zeus is looking at us now. I told you, Prometheus, these people are not our equal. They need to learn their places in the muck and the mire forever looking at us in the Olympian Tower, us as the only source of power. Why, their very birth makes them of less worth and should therefore submit to the will and the rod of the gods. You have disobeyed us have betrayed our trust and your class. And for what? For this lowly race? These people don't deserve to look us in the face. It's right that they should cower, not flourish and flower. Look at their egos grow fatter and fatter. Prometheus, they are nothing compared to us. Their lives don't matter. Zeus. I understand your fear and trepidation. I do. I mean, if my daddy tried to eat me at birth like yours did, <laughs> I'd be suspicious of everything, too. I'm just saying that neither we Titans nor you Olympians have been exemplary. Who can tell mortals how they should be? And we have no experiences to tell us what mortals could potentially become. See, because they are not burdened by immortality, they must make the most of the feeding time they have. They must cherish every breath they take, every moment between heartbreak, every laugh. And because they cannot see as far as we, they have to imagine and envision what a better future could be and believe that they can work to achieve it. And they are doing so, little by little, with little or no help from us. Zeus, can you not see that they are more than this mere quintessence of dust? Zeus, Prometheus, we both see far enough to know for sure that allowing them to acquire the knowledge of making fire was what began all this. Look at what else they've learned. They've figured out how to burn this earth. They've become a scourge, killing the very dirt upon which they stand. I told you, Prometheus, be afraid of men. Look, look at what they've done. But for now, this creature is a plague a nightmare that invades the very dreams of gods. What else will they do in the future that's too far to gauge? Prometheus, you who are one with forethought, look now upon what your actions have been. Hitler, Mengele, Himmler, Caligula, Newton, Darwin, Einstein, Asia, Bloody Mary, Jim Jones, Imhotep, Nina Simone, Hirohito, Mozart, Pol Pot, Rosa Parks, Idi Amin, Martin the King, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, Da Vinci, Fury, Bach, Tony Morrison, Torquemada, Stalin, Goebbels, Robespierre, Confucius, Lee Paul, William Shakespeare. Music, singing, dancing, philosophy, human caused famines, mass destructive weaponry, science, farming, education. Sorry, science, farming, education, clothing, unintentional introduction of invasive species, architecture, farming, libraries, languages, causing climate change and denying what the danger is, space travel, pyramids, the will, the printing press. Look at those oceans. Look at all that mess. They discovered the electromagnetic spectrum, relativity, subatomic particles, light speed, gravity, holocausts. Genocides, killing fields, slavery, bullets, gas chambers, nuclear missile 
harnessed solar energy, metallurgy, microscopes, China's Great Wall, the compass, the telescope, overpopulation, deforestation, germ warfare, greed over need, and a refusal to care. They landed on the moon. Back the human genome, invented, it discovered the laws of motion, invented the telephone. Too many of them, Prometheus, suffer, are left bereft and alone. Vaccinations, light bulbs, countless tools, poetry, mathematics, ice cream, the golden rule. Prometheus, don't be a fool. Listen to me. They will disappoint you. Well, maybe. I guess we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, so we're going to have another little um, exchange, if you wouldn't mind, just so we know that you know we're not all damned all the time. And as I said earlier, right? You know, any day we get up is 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 a fine day, another day to be alive, and to get something right, and to make new mistakes, and to try to correct those, and to be better with human beings, be better to ourselves. So I just want you to think about that in the spirit of this, which is. I want you to say one word, two words. Well, few. It's been a good day. Can you just say that? It's been a good day. Right. And so you're going to say that again. You'll know when you come in. Uh, but that's just to remind us again, that's it. Um, let me make sure I have it here. Now, I wrote this piece to draw your attention to all the Good, the nightly news will fail to mention. That's all the bad that could have happened to us all today, but somehow didn't. I wrote it because I often find this homo sapien sapien species of mind often has a mind inclined toward being pessimistic. It's not our fault. See, these big brains of ours tend to trend us toward the dark. And, well, that's an evolutionary thing, by the way. But if for a moment we afforded some thoughts to disasters we've thus far avoided, I think we'd have to say, hey, it's <laughs> Given all that could have gone straight, yeah. life's capricious come with maze. Yeah. It's not a crazy thing to say. It's been a good day. A good day. Now, when things get hard, look at the bright side. At least today you haven't lost another eye. Cops didn't find your stash. Cops didn't find your stash. You didn't get into a car crash and die. Didn't become the subject of a true crime drama. Didn't get bitten by a rabbit llama. Didn't get tongue kissed by the ghost of your best friend Brandon. <laughs> didn't get a butt clock. Didn't catch a case of crotch rot. <laughs> didn't discover a new orifice in a place you would rather have not. <laughs> so given all that could be going wrong with you right now, but ain't, let's say we just admit it. <laughs> all that could have gone astray. <laughs> given life's capricious come with me. <laughs> Not a crazy thing to say. It's been a good day. Now, the other day, I was walking along, had my favorite shoes on. What did I do? Step the dog to the dog. Oh, man, it's wrong. Well, that's when it dawned on me that as this epiphany came to me that I could have been walking down the street wearing no shoes at all. <laughs> I remember what someone said when I was in the sixth or seventh grade. It was about a bird dropping a present in his eye. He said, first he got mad, then he thought and got real glad, and thank God that cows don't fly. <laughs> it's been a good day. Given all that could have gone astray. Given life's capricious come with maze. I think it's not a crazy thing to say. <laughs> So um, I like to have a little fun with this stuff too. You know, I, my thing when it comes to poetry is that you take the work seriously, not yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, just just you know, try to be as human as possible, and 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 you know, go for those spaces within us that that need some illumination, maybe some of those spaces that need some thinking. And now and then, and we go through these these parts all the time. 
my um i grew up in chicago my family was part of that um the great migration that had come up in, in the sort of 1960s and um i want to read something that harks back to that and some of you might re might remember this experience because you probably had it too it's called um the first time i experienced jimmy hendrix <laughs> It was, for me, it was the summer of 1976. I was nine years old and America was drunk kissing itself in a year long celebration of its 200th birthday. My family and I lived on Chicago's West Side, many sections of which were still economically devastated from the riots of 1968. I sat down in front of the tube with a bowl of something with too much sugar and too little nutrition and began thumbing through TV Guide magazine. Anyone remember TV Guide magazine? <laughs> TV Guide magazine. As I looked through the program's schedules, I saw that highlights of the 1969 concert at Woodstock would be playing on the local PBS station. I heard of Woodstock, but it was something I didn't know much about. So I decided to check it. I turned on the TV, and the first act I see is The Who playing My Generation. I remember thinking, man, these Brits can play. But even then, at not yet 10, I could tell, them white boys is high as hell. <laughs> Next came this cat, Richie Havens, who I had never heard of either, but would open for later at the club I've seen in paint in Cambridge. The brother was a big brown bear, gravelly voicing a tune he called Freedom on the melody of Motherless Child. It was fierce and piercingly raucous, his hand like hand strumming, no pummeling an acoustic guitar so hard I was surprised the strains didn't snap. Then came a clip of Hendrix. He was a thin, fretboard of a man, wearing a red, sweat-soaked headband wrapped so tightly around his afro head, it looked like one of those mushrooms I know he had to be tripping on. <laughs> he was rocking this sky-blue Native American-style jacket with tassels hanging from the back and sleeves like Spanish moss. He looked down at his guitar, hit the strings, and unleashed an opening salvo of devil dream distortion, feedback, and electronic spills. Yo, this was no guitar. This was no Fender strap. In Hendrix's hands, it was a strangled white witch bullet putting a six-string hex on a crowd of acid-taking weed whack hippies. And Hendrix was a voodoo priest, priest demanding that all of hell's demons come up and dance in the rain. <laughs> then he launched into this, to, he launched into the first notes of the Star Spangled Banner. And I was like a 1970s version of WTF. I had never heard anything like this. Being the son of a cop father, something about what Hendrix was doing was felt disrespectful. Being the son of a Jehovah's Witness mother, something about it felt sacrilegious. But being me and the age I was, there was something about the fact that my parents would hate it that, that made me lean in and open to being to take the American anthem and twist it in and out of recognizability seemed almost like treason. I couldn't help but watch and listen. So how can I say this? I fell in love. Later, I began digging what Hendricks was really saying when he was playing the national anthem. He was saying that there is both a beauty and a beastliness in this country, and that fighting for freedom and justice for all often means being angry and loving. It means wrestling with both ignorance and ideals that we have to learn how to accept the distorted and distort what is commonly accepted. And that sometimes, like now, when things get ugly in this country, America must try and make music out of our mangled demands. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes to the top of the hour, so. So, we're, and, but we're doing a, we don't we're doing a Q&A, so. Yeah. How long before Q&A? What do you want to do, Ken? We're five minutes. Five minutes before Q&A? Okay. So, right. then, I'll, I'll end hmm. with this one, since we are in church. Um. Since we are in the church. Ten minutes. 
two things. Um, head and gentlemen, we'll read this. We have anybody here who are um, still in their 20s? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody who used to be in their 20s? <laughs> This is gonna say anything about the bottom of the stock. You remember the 20s, you didn't, you weren't there. So two energies. Um, energy of fire. Um, one based on Shakespeare's as you like it. There's a um, um, a character in Jacques, who is melancholy, and he, he's the one who we get that all the world is a stage. And so I took this. Um, I guess speaking to my 20-some-year-old self. And made it all your life as a stage. And if you, um, if this resonates with you, great. All your life is a stage. And you sisters and brothers, in betweens and others, you have your exits and your entrances and your various performances. And in fits and starts, still play many parts. First, you come into the scene, writhing and screaming, nearly blind and dumb, drooling to the gums, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. This time is now lost to you, and you cannot recall any of it at all. You are innocent and ignorant of scream, scroll, and scripture. But before you know it, you are hit with a torrent of facts and figures, indoctrinated by these bigger critters, adults who give you the rules of both school and home, who tell you on which side of which line it is that you belong. And so you begin dividing the world into thems and days, thatses and thises, hymns and hers, misters and misses, and just when you think you get the rules down pat just a little bit, you discover the thunderous bliss of kisses. That just messes up everything. <laughs> For how can so small and seemingly meaningless a thing bring you to a place where you find you are displaced of gravity, floating, eyes closed, bearingless and caringless, and the blessedness of it? And while you are lost and still reeling in the wake of that feeling, some well meaning killjoy comes to ask you, So, kid, what do you want to do with your life? What will you do for work? How will you earn? Will you learn a trade, kid? Will you matriculate into college? Will you choose one or none of both of those options? Come on, kid. The bus is leaving, kid. Got to make some decisions, kid. If you don't want to be lost or left behind, you better quit. Better hop on and do like we did, kid. Some big chance. And we give you a part of the world to carry. How long with some instructions? Hurry up. Hurry up. Don't slow down. Don't mess around. Don't dilly. Don't dally. Don't dawdle. Don't bobble. Don't wobble. Don't tarry. And after decades of doing this, sometimes you find that in between those lifted loads you carry down those well worn roads, a knowing comes to you. You begin to find that sometimes. Your older, slightly blurred eyes you have achieved a sharp vision. The beginning of some species of wisdom, a wisdom revealing a truth that she sinks in your youth, but now you know without doubt that there were only a few things really worth giving one tenth of one inch of damn fountain. A sense of being found and flowered open by the a hand reaching for yours when you are lost in the hydra-headed darkness that makes you tremble and sway. A long needed, much too short cry and laugh with those who walk with you along the way. Just a little more poetry and the blessed thought of doing it again. Well, I'll end with a with, with a micro sermon. <laughs> Since uh, we are the church, make sure that I can in front of you here. Begins with a quote. Human is up to you. To my fellow human, 
Every dream I've ever dreamed has had the sound of your voice. Every nightmare I've survived has borne your face. The only thing I know about the devil is what I have seen us be to one another. And the only thing I know about God is what I trust we can someday become. Those words were written by poet Stephen Mason. Mason was a decorated veteran and captain in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. As a young man, he had seen destruction, violence, and death on a scale that for most of us, I imagine, would be unimaginable. However, even after all he'd seen and experienced, and as a soldier no doubt caused, he still found a space within himself to contemplate, question, and have faith that in spite of everything, the human being could be better if we chose to. Every dream I've ever dreamed is at the sound of your voice. Every nightmare I've ever survived is on your face. The only thing I know about the devil is what I have seen us be to one another. And the only thing I know about God is what I trust we can someday become. I've often thought of those words, delved into the idea of what dreams my words might have served as the soundtrack for. For whom has my face taken on the facade of nightmare? When have I unwittingly done the devil's work in fomenting separation between myself and you, my fellow human beings? What does it take for me to be about the work of my highest transcendent self? What does it demand of me? For me, answers to such queries are best discovered in deep self-contemplation and self-questioning. Sometimes as I do this, it is spoken aloud and takes the shape of poetry. Sometimes there are no words for it, only a melancholic longing that finds a melody that when aspirated comes out like some kind of blues infected negoon. And sometimes as I am sharing a spiritual artistic experience with others, no matter what sounds resound around me, I find it as an inner silence. There are times when within that silence is pulsing, like a heart beyond my own, one that I seem to share with every human being willing to hear it. And this brings us into a consciousness, a conscious mind that I know in my heart that knows but sometimes forgets. That is, you're all connected. And sometimes, before this moment fades, as it inevitably will, and I can too quickly return to that, to this world's noise and sink back into the daily blindness. There is a moment in which I find the courage to ask the questions, why am I here? Why am I? Period. Who am I doing? What am I doing with this now? The only now I know I have. Who was being exploited for my comfort? How do I rationalize the sufferings of others? Whose pain have I ignored so I can be who I think I am and be left alone in whatever peace I can gather? What sobbings and screams have I mistaken for music? And sometimes before this shame that I carry with me finds me, the wrestling begins. And I want to write myself as a new narrative. One in which I naked myself of my prejudices and my human limiting assumptions about me. One in which I guard myself anew and begin a dance born out of a new relationship to you. One in which we choose to dance together and recognize that we are all complex biological galaxies being held together by a gravity. We know but can't yet understand. So let us all take this moment, the one moment we have together and Choose to live as manifestations and more manifestations of our highest, most transcendent selves. Choose every day to do this, even if we know every day we're going to fail. Let us choose to create new relationship beyond the tyranny of our worst inheritances. Choose to use mind and muscle and influence to be sword and shield for those more vulnerable than ourselves to come off of the mountain. Let's refuse to turn away from human suffering. Choose to be the cure for the cancer of the human spirit. So, 
human, you uppity collection of elements and breath. You improbable species spinning on this blue green stone, hurtling through the impulse. Look at your hands. Look at your hands, human. Envision what dreams they can be. Ponder what nightmares they can conjure. Think of what they can build. Think of what they can destroy. What truth and wisdom do they point toward? What life can they bring? What lives can they touch? What words can your hands, worlds can your hands kill? What worlds can they heal? Every day, we can choose to move through the wounded body of this world as either a disease or an agent of healing. Human, look at your hands. It's up to you. Choose. Amen. Mm -hmm.